I was thinking as I was coming in to, to, to share with you guys this morning about Christmas when I was three. I mean, you guys remember Christmas when you were three? A couple of people. See, I remember Christmas uh, when I was three because of the gift I got for Christmas when I was three. It was a Care Bear. If you don't know what a Care Bear is, it's from the 80s. I'm sure they'll have a movie about it because they're doing movies with all the 80s stuff now. A uh, Care Bear, so it was, a, it was a teddy bear. It was about this big. It had a big heart on, its, on, on, his, on his stomach. His name was Tender Heart. And Tender Heart became my most prized possession at the age of three years old. Until I was about 14. No. 10. 14. Tender Heart was the stuffy I required in order to be able to sleep. Ever. Uh, and and it, was, it was so important to me that one time we actually, we were staying at my grandmother's house and we drove to a town about an hour away. And she had to courier the thing to me. She had to pay like $200 to have this stuffed animal like delivered to me in this town, you know, an hour away because I couldn't sleep that night without this stuffed animal. Uh, my parents at one point in time bought, they found one at like a thrift store that kind of looked like mine and they bought it. But I'm like, this, is, this isn't my stuffy. My stuffy, like the, fur, you guys ever read the Velveteen Rabbit story? Yeah. So you guys know like, like the fur's all worn off in different places. If you were to see my tender heart, my stuffed tit, which I still have today, but if you were to see my tender heart stuffed animal, like, like the fur's worn off around the neck, the fur's worn off like in one part in his back. He's, he's been washed probably like 50 times because of all the times I like threw up on him and everything. You know, like, like hey, hey you're, you're three years old and you keep a stuffy with you every night for seven years. Stuff's going to happen. But you couldn't ever replace it with another one. Even if it was an identical one, like, you know, same manufacturing date, all that, because it wasn't mine. I didn't want any imitation, any, any copycat version of my stuffed animal. Any of you guys ever think of a stuffed animal like that? Any of you guys have something like that? Do you guys know that? I mean, maybe you don't use them anymore, but you remember having one when you were littler. Or maybe you have a little brother or sister who feels this way about a stuffed animal. So what's true of these stuffed animals can be true of other things we deal with in life. Let me give you an example. Ketchup. You don't want imitation ketchup. Because you can tell the difference, right? You get like the name brand Heinz ketchup and you squirt that on your hot dog or your hamburger, it's like, this is ketchup. When somebody buys the, the, the cheap stuff from Superstore because you have to or whatever, it's like, this is not the same at all. Another example, craft dinner. <laughs> If, if you buy the non-KD craft dinner and you try and mix up that cheese sauce in the pot, like the cheese stays like all lumpy and inconsistent, the color's not exact, like it's not the same, you know what I mean? Yeah. One more example. Toilet paper. Like I'm not saying anything about those porta potties at the tent door here. But do you know the toilet paper and the porta potties across the tent door right here? It's more like sandpaper, right? You know? Yeah. So, you want to have the real thing, the real thing with ketchup, the real thing with Kraft Dinner, the real thing with toilet paper. Now, all this talking about stuffies and Kraft Dinner and toilet paper made me think of the Bible. I'm weird that way. Just kind of go with it. Thank you for laughing. I'll pay you later. So, if you, if you were to read your Bibles, you would hear about a guy by the name of St. Paul. We celebrated his feast day yesterday. Wrote most of the New Testament. And St. Paul, one of the letters he writes to the community of the Galatians, kind of this fledgling Christian community, this is what he says to them. He says, I am astonished. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> I am astonished. No, okay, no. Should I keep going? Okay. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to twist the gospel of Christ, want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Like, what? I am astonished that you're leaving for an imitation, a cheap copycat version, like the fake stuffy or the imitation craft dinner or the fake ketchup or the sandpaper that we're using in the porta potties right now. You're leaving the real thing for something else. Now, obviously, this was a problem 20 centuries ago, which is why St. Paul's like, hey, smarten up and stick to the real thing. This is not a problem today, is it? 
It, it's, I'm, I'm looking out at you guys, and, and we're here at the Catholic Family Life Conference, you know? And you guys are, I mean, I think we had like one only child in the room here. You guys are from, from, from families who, for the most part, probably, you know, you're regular churchgoers. Um, you, you either go to catechism at church, or you, or, or, you know, maybe you, you do catechism at home, or, or you have religion classes at school, or whatever it might be. And you guys probably have a decent sense of, of different bits of our story. You know, you could name the four Gospels, right? Okay, give me four Gospels. Go. Can you name the 12 apostles? That's a little bit tougher, right? Can you tell me the Ten Commandments? Okay, a few people nodding their heads here. Okay, so you know a lot of these things. But you can know a lot of these things. The Galatians heard from St. Paul who Jesus was, what the gospel was, what the good news was. And they were really tempted by this, this, this cheap imitation. Now, let me take a step back here for a second. You know why people buy imitation craft dinner or imitation ketchup or sandpaper, toilet paper? It's cheaper. And sometimes you gotta do it, right? You know, if, if, if some of you guys, you know, in five or six years from now, you're gonna move out of home, you're gonna, you're gonna go to university and you have a limited amount of money to buy stuff with and it's I can buy five boxes of imitation craft dinner or I can buy one box of the name brand KD. Well, if, if you gotta eat for a week, five boxes would be better than one, agreed? And you kind of deal with it when you've got nothing else because it costs less to buy the imitation, to buy the generic version. And sometimes you just got to do that. It is what it is. The reason why people will go to a cheap imitation version of the gospel is because it asks less of them. Now, about 17 years ago, before you were all born, the University of Notre Dame in the United States uh, they undertook a study called the National Survey on Youth and Religion. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to know the relationship between young people i.e. you, and their different religions. And they surveyed literally hundreds of young people across kind of, you know, on, on our continent here in North America. And, and they, they did three or four follow-up surveys with a lot of these young people. And they, and they sort of wanted to know, you know, how, how has your relationship with religion evolved? You know, as you went from being 14 to being 19 to being 23 to being, you know, in, in your late 20s. And here's one of the, the craziest things that they learned. The most popular religion amongst young people, so you guys, in our part of the world today, is not even an organized religion. They called it, and they kind of made up this fancy name for it, it's called Moralistic Therapeutic Deism. What? what? Exactly. All right, so think about this, moral. Okay, morals. Moral, like the idea of right and wrong. You should do something, you shouldn't do something. You guys with me on that? So moralistic, therapeutic, to make you feel better about yourself, and deism is about God. So it's this thing about God that has some sort of rules that makes you feel better about yourself. Now, they, they sort of went through the most common religion. This isn't, it's not organized. It hasn't been founded by anybody. They don't have gatherings on Sunday anywhere. But their comment was there are people who practice this religion in every major Christian denomination in North America. Five things that people who, who, who follow this, this religion or this, this so-called religion, this is what they believe. Number one, a God exists who created and orders the world and watches over human life on earth. Sounds pretty good, right? We believe that, right? We absolutely believe a God exists, okay? If you didn't realize that, we believe God exists. Very important, okay? You heard about grade nine Ryan earlier, right? You learned about how God exists. We absolutely believe God exists. Do we believe that God created everything? Do we believe that he watches over life, here, you know, human life here on earth? Absolutely, yes, very important. Um, number two, God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other. Yeah. That, sounds, that's, that sounds pretty good. He wants people to be good nice, good, nice, and fair to each other, as taught in the Bible and by most world religions. All right. These first two, we can kind of go with this, row, right? God does want us to be good to each other. Absolutely. Love one another as I have loved you. That's part of it, right? Number three, the central goal of life is to be happy. Oh. And to feel good about yourself. This is the therapeutic part of it, right? It's to serve God. Well, it's, it's to serve God. Why? I'll, I'll let you guys in on a little hint here, okay? The central goal of life, if, if you want to look at what we're about, happiness may or may not end up being part of it. The central goal of life is to get to heaven. The reason why we serve God, the reason why we do all these things, 
we were made to go to heaven. Like, this, this is the whole point. God created us to be with him in heaven. And this life is meant to help get us there. And, and part of the idea is to drag as many people with us as we can. The central goal of life is not to be happy. Because there are a lot of people who serve God who suffer tremendously. Absolutely. St. Paul, St. Peter, St. John Paul II, uh, St. Teresa of Calcutta. People who experience, oh, we could go on and on and on and on here, right? But they don't suffer without, without recognizing God's presence with them or recognizing the end goal of their sufferings. Okay? So you see where this is going a little off the rails here, right? Central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about yourself. Number four. God does not, to be invol- God does not need to be involved in your life except when you need him to resolve a problem. Now, if I was to put myself into your shoes, when I, you know, grade seven Mike... 12-year-old Mike, that is exactly how I thought about God. God was that emergency handle. You're like, "Uh uh-oh, things are going wrong. Pull this handle. The day that I was six and put the car through the garage door at our house, I thought the car was in the wrong gear, so I moved the gear shift, and the car left forward and went through the garage door, almost ran over my mom. That was a day I prayed. But a lot of people are, this is what prayer is for. I'll pray when something goes wrong or when I haven't studied for a test or when, when, when somebody I know is sick or something. And those are all good moments to pray, but God is needed for more than just that. But moralistic therapeutic deism, that long, crazy term, the idea here is that we don't need to pray except when there's an emergency. Otherwise, other than that, God just wants us to, to worry about ourselves. And lastly, good people go to heaven when they die. A few of you are like, well, okay, you guys ever hear the story in the gospel of the rich young man? Okay, I'll I'll refresh your memory on this one. It's it's, it's across several gospels, several different versions of it. But the, the short version of it is this. So this man walks up to Jesus and says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus is like, why do you call me good? There's no one good but God. If you want to be, if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Which ones? Well, he goes through them. Don't murder. How many of you guys have ever murdered somebody? I'm a little concerned here. Okay, most of us never murder anybody. That one's one's kind of easy. It's easy not to murder somebody, okay? Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. Honor your father and your mother. All right. How many of you ever told a lie? Okay, put your hands there. How many of you have ever told a second lie to cover up the first one? All right, how many of you just watch this kind of like, at this point you're like, I'm committed now, I'm going to kind of keep going with it, right? A few of you are like, yeah, totally, right? How many of you have ever disrespected your parents? Okay, so... Just, just for the record here, the commandment to honor your father and mother doesn't mean you're never going to disagree with your parents. also doesn't mean you're never going to fight with them, but it's how you do that that can be honoring them or dishonoring them. You know what I mean? You're, you're going to have arguments with people that you love. That's the nature of living in relationships with people. But if you have a fight with them, you're like, I hate you and wish you were dead. Well, that's a whole other level beyond, you know, I just wanted to have another cookie. You know, it's, it's kind of kind of get a little bit carried away here. But the, the young man, this guy says to Jesus, I've kept these commandments since I was young. This man is the definition of a good person. And he says, but what am I missing? Because there is more to life than just being a good person. And this is where Jesus levels the challenge at him that he can't handle, if you remember the story. Sell everything you own, give, give it to the poor, come and follow me. And he can't do it. He can't make the great bet on Jesus. So when you look at this, this creed of this, this so-called religion, I'm going to call it a parasite. Because it's got enough truth on it to sound kind of good. Like as I went through the first couple, you're like, yeah, I'm kind of good with that. And even in the last few, there's a little bit there that makes sense. We are supposed to be nice to each other, but not just nice. It's not be nice to other, each other, one another. It's I have been nice to you. This is how they shall know you are my disciples, as you are nice to one another. What is the word that Jesus uses? Which is a lot more than just being nice. But there's enough truth in this that it's really tempting. And, and I don't know if you, any of you guys have ever read the C.S. Lewis's Screw Tape Letters. 
if you, if you, if you, if you have come across these. It's, it's a great set of stories. C.S. Lewis, uh, he basically, if, if you've never read this story, it's a story of letters between uh, a couple of, of Satan's tempters, a couple of demons, about their strategy to try and lead us away from their enemy, which is our God. And one of their big strategies has always been to skew the truth, to blur the truth so it doesn't make sense to us. So we're tempted to go towards something else. Think about the story of Adam and Eve in the garden. Right? You go back to the garden. You go back to the beginning of the story, right? The devil walks up to Adam and Eve and says, did I hear right? Did God really say not to eat any fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Is that what God said? No, what did God tell them not to do? Fruit from one tree and one tree alone, right? But, but by saying, hey, God's cutting you off from all of this stuff. Oh, there's enough truth in there to get them wondering, is he holding out something else from us? What's he holding back from us? Well, what's going to happen if you eat the fruit from the one tree? Well, you're going to die. Well, you're not going to die. If you eat the fruit, you'll be just like God, which is ironic because if you read the story, God created them in his image and likeness. They were already like God. It's all about blurring things. It's all about kind of pulling us away from what we're supposed to be. So to make a long story short, you guys live in a world where a lot of your peers, a lot of the people that you're going to be around, whether it's people, you know, you, you go to school with people you encounter, this is going to be their view of what Christianity is actually about. Christianity is about being good people and being nice to each other. And, and yeah, there's a God out there who made stuff, but we don't really need him unless things go wrong, unless, unless we actually need his help for something that, 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 that isn't going the way we want it to. So how do you fight back? And I want to suggest to you three simple strategies that you can take on Three things that you can do every day to make sure that you don't get drawn away from what St. Paul called the gospel of Christ, the only gospel, into some fake, cheap imitation, lumpy cheese, craft dinner, sandpaper, toilet paper, fake ketchup kind of religion. You guys, you guys up for that? You guys up for that? Yeah! Pretend you are, okay? So, three things you can do. Now... First one, is anybody here afraid of the dark? <laughs> I'm not so much afraid of the dark. I'm afraid of what's in the dark. It's like, I'm not really afraid of heights. I'm not even afraid of falling from heights. It's that sudden stop at the end that I'm scared of, right? <laughs> I have been scared of the dark as long as I can remember. Okay? Uh, I, uh, when I was a kid, my, my family, when I was seven years old, we moved to a house that had an unfinished basement. Oh. Nobody always groans about this because you know exactly where this is going, right? So the unfinished basement, so my dad installed a bunch of like light fixtures with the pull strings on them, all, all kind of throughout the basement. So you'd go downstairs and you'd pull in a light, and then you'd pull in like, you know, kind of eight or nine individual light bulbs kind of all throughout the basement. And then he rolled out some old carpet and put all my toys in, in you know, kind of one corner of the basement and said, this is your playroom now. Your toys stay down here. And I'm like, well, maybe. He, I think he thought it meant I had a whole lot of space I could make a mess and it wouldn't get into his, his stuff. But... When I would go down the stairs to play, I would turn on every single light in the basement. Every last one of them. Like all the ones, I, you know, the ones on the far side. And then my mom would come downstairs to get food for supper from the deep freeze, because that was over on one side of the basement. And she'd be like, wow, why are all the lights on? You know, turn off all the ones except the one right above me. And then they'd call me upstairs for supper later on. And I'd look up and realize that I was in the lone little section of light surrounded by darkness. I'm like, well, I can probably survive down here for a couple of days. And then my stomach would rumble, and I'm like, I must listen to the rumbling stomach. So I would, I would kind of leapfrog the light. So I'd run to the next one, and I'd turn it on and run back and turn the first one off, and I'd you know, kind of run my whole way back to the staircase, and that's how I'd get back upstairs. And if one of the lights didn't turn off properly, oh well, just leaving it. Totally scared of the dark. Um, I used to carry around a little, like, um, a little tiny flashlight in my pocket all the time. The greatest invention of apps that they ever put onto any cell phone ever, the flashlight. Okay? I don't need to carry around a flashlight anymore because I've got one always. Totally afraid of the dark. This fear actually got worse when I got into my 20s. You're like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> like, you're talking about stuffed animals with us and now you're scared of this. This, kid, this guy's a wimp. Can we get Ryan back up here? 
Okay, so in my 20s, I was working uh, at Holy Family Parish in St. Albert as the youth minister there. And, and when, you're, when you're a youth minister, one of your, one of your jobs, um, often you're running youth nights, so you're the last one to leave the building repeatedly. Yeah, dark church, hey? Eh? Like, woohoo! All right. And when you're the last one to leave the church building, you have to check all the doors and turn on the security system. This is kind of one of your responsibilities. So, you know, I, I got pretty good at this because it, it kind of became this thing where I have to check every door because people have this habit of leaving through whatever door they feel like leaving through whenever they're in a church. So I would, I would hide this kind of this, this circuit I would do. I would start in the office. I'd walk through the old chapel. I'd check the door to Mary's garden. So people from Holy Family, you can, you can kind of picture me kind of walking through, go across, you know, bow to the altar, go check the other door on the other side, go back out through the hall. I'd check, check every single door in the building because if any one of them isn't latched properly, the system doesn't arm. Now, in order to properly understand the rest of the story, I need to tell you about my friend Brian. My friend Brian, he's, uh, he's about this tall. He's, uh, he's now a retired Edmonton City Police officer. When I, when I met him, he was still on active duty. Brian is physically one of the most intimidating men I've met. Not because he's tall, but because his neck is like this thick. <laughs> and he's also the hairiest man I know. Like, if he ever, if he ever like, took off a shirt, he'd be like, take off the sweater too. Like, he's, he doesn't so much have hair, he's got fur all over him. <laughs> so I always talk about Brian, he's kind of like a taller Ewok or a shorter Wookiee. Now, because Brian was working as a police officer and I was, I was working as a youth minister, we worked dumb hours. We were often, you know, getting off work at like 10 o'clock at night and our wives don't want to stay up late. So Brian and I had a habit of, you know, once a month or so going to see some late night movie at the North Edmonton Cinemas. And so this one particular Sunday night, you know, we had, we had our, our, our youth mass, we had a light night that followed, and I was going to go catch, I don't know, like Transformers 1 or something like that with Brian in the movie theater. And so Brian had gone to put his kids to bed, and what I didn't know was that Brian had come back to church to wait for me to finish up. And because Brian's not afraid of the dark, he just went and sat in the dark church and prayed and waited for me. Now, my first clue that this was not something accidental is the fact that when Brian came back to church, he parked his car around the corner. So that when my last young person left the church and I looked out in the parking lot, the only car that was still there was mine. So I began my circuit going through the church. So I walked through, I checked the door to Mary's garden, you know, as I'm passing the altar and Brian sees me coming in this totally dark church, he lays down in his pew. <laughs> and he waits for me. And he's over by where the second door is. And so when I, when I click the second door, I check the second door. As I spin around, all I see flying towards me is this giant hair you up going, <laughs> In my reaction in this moment, I physically fell on the ground. I might have peed a little bit. I was so mad. But I can tell you, because I worked for churches for seven more years after this, I have never again locked up a church in the dark. <laughs> Turn on every light. <laughs> I occasionally like take off my shoe and like throw it ahead of me to see if Brian would come flying out of somewhere. Unreasonable fears. Very scared of the dark. Very scared of, you know, what giant Ewok is hiding in the dark. We have powder failures in my house, and I still freak out, like, go see why the power's out. No, Brian might be hiding downstairs. It's completely unreasonable. Now, the crazy thing about being scared of the dark is you know what it takes to conquer the dark? And not even a lot of light. If you've ever been to the Easter Vigil, which is like the most beautiful liturgy in the entire church year. The church starts off completely dark. And yes, I am nervous that Brian is hiding ready to scare me in the Easter Vigil. And then the light of Christ comes into the room. And then that one candlelight turns into hundreds of them. And what was dark is completely transformed by the light. Little, little kind of life hack for you guys. One of the solutions to most of the spiritual problems you will ever have is drawing yourself, is putting yourself back with the light. Is making sure that you have a rich and deep prayer life. That your interior life is something that's growing, that's vibrant, that you know Jesus. Not just about Jesus. Not just the stories about him. Not just be able to name for me the four gospels and eight of the twelve apostles and seven of the ten commandments or whatever it might be but that you yourself know Jesus deeply, intimately, personally. You dive into the lives of the saints, and one of the things that you're going to find 
is that they have this rich interior life. It's what enables them to endure through the sufferings they experience. It's what enables them to do, endure the persecutions they go through, the misunderstandings. And it's what helps them make sure that they don't get caught up by some cheap imitation gospel like moralistic therapeutic deism. Draw near to Christ. Number one. Number two. Anybody here play sports? Okay. Anybody, uh, anybody play hockey? Baseball? Soccer? Football? Cricket? Curling? Okay. The thing about learning a new sport, okay, I grew up in the 80s, which is a long time ago for some of you. But I grew up in the 80s. When I grew up in the 80s, hockey was the thing. Hockey, I mean, hockey in a lot of ways still is the thing, but particularly in the Edmonton area, hockey was the thing because the Oilers just, all they did was win in the 80s. I turned 10 years old and I watched the Oilers win their fifth Stanley Cup in my lifetime. My, my oldest son just turned 10 years old and he's seen them win one playoff series. But, you know, this is, this is kind of how it goes. But I always wanted to play hockey. And, and, you know, for financial and not wanting to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning reasons, I never played hockey as a kid. So when I turned 24, I decided, you know what, I'm going to give this a shot. So I signed up for a beer league hockey team, which is like, you know, kind of basically old guys who never got to play hockey or were never quite good enough to play hockey who just want to keep playing hockey. Some of them do. I'm allergic, so I don't. But, but you know, it was, it, was, it was a great experience. I got, I got put on a team. But here's the thing. When I went to my first hockey practice with these guys, I'd never actually worn hockey gear before. Like, I'd, I'd worn a hockey helmet, because you, you have to, or in, in gloves, and you know about skates. But all the rest of it that kind of goes in between, I never put it on. So I had all this gear, you know, like tags hanging off some of the new stuff, a bunch of used stuff as well. You know, I went to the dressing room early, and I sat, and I started talking to the guys, and I watched the rest of them putting their gear on, because I'm like, I have no idea how to put this stuff on. Now, I should have paid closer attention, because um, there's one particular piece of gear that you use to protect a very sensitive area. <laughs> I put it in upside down. And I got home and I'm like, I had these massive bruises on the insides of my thighs. And I'm like, I said to him, I remember like, he's like, what did you do? I'm like, I, he's like, it's upside down, man. I feel shame. <laughs> and pain. Um, but I had to learn how to do it. I had to figure it out because I'd never done it before. So uh, some of you guys know who Bishop Robert Barron is, the auxiliary bishop of Los Angeles. And Bishop Robert Barron, he... Uh, he talks a lot about baseball, because you're from the States. Baseball's kind of like their version. Like baseball for them is what hockey is for us. Everybody wants to play baseball. It's kind of the great American pastime. And he talks about, about, about baseball when he talks about Christianity, because he said for him, Christianity is like an apprenticeship. Okay? You're supposed to learn how to do it. Some of you guys might have parents who are uh, electricians or carpenters or people who have some kind of a trade. Now, when you learn a trade, if you become a carpenter or you become a, an electrician, they don't just be like, hey, here's a saw. Go figure it out. You apprentice yourself to a journeyman. You find somebody who knows what they're doing, and you watch them do it. And then they show you how to do it. And then they watch you do it. And then they leave you alone, and they go do something else. And eventually, you yourself kind of work your way through this in some coursework and stuff like that, and you become a journeyman yourself, and you learn how to apprentice somebody else. Well, Bishop Barron says, this is what Christianity is supposed to be. We're not supposed to just kind of, you know, well, hey, go figure it out for yourself. We're supposed to learn it by apprenticeship. So if you're going to learn how to play baseball, you know, the first time you step onto a diamond, a coach is going to show you the basic motions of the game. How to throw a ball, how to catch a ball, how to swing a bat, how to slide into base without, like, breaking your arms or legs or something like that. You know, and in a lot of ways, a lot of you might, might remember your parents teaching you how to do a proper sign of the cross, how to genuflect, you know, you know, put your hands like this if you're going to receive communion on the hand, right? You know, if you're going to receive on the tongue, make sure you stick your tongue up far enough so the priest isn't putting his hand in your mouth. Like, like, it seems like silly little stuff, but it's important. But the apprenticeship is supposed to go beyond just the externals. It's supposed to come down to the internals. How do you sit through a holy hour? What do you do after you receive communion? Why do we spend... 20 minutes meditating on these different mysteries of the rosary to learn more about the life of Jesus. One of my, uh, one of my youth ministry mentors, one of the people I apprenticed with a little bit, his name was Father Mike Moreau. He was a, a, a great priest. He passed away a few years back, but he used to always say, religion needs a lab. 
Now, some of you guys who, who um, have done science experiments at different times, I will never forget my first grade seven science experiment. We were told to grow mold. We were given a little piece of bread and some water, and, and it was put underneath a heat lamp, and it was like, you know, you put as much water in there as you want to. Now, I always thought about the fact that the bread sitting in the counter always dried out, so I barely put any water in. But one of the kids in my class, he actually soaked his little crouton of bread. And, like, the mold grew so much over the week that we did this that the Petri dish actually was, like, lifting up. And if we would have left it for a month, it probably would have walked off of the whole cart. <laughs> but I'll never forget it because we actually did it. You know, I want to at some point get on ice and try curling for myself because it's way different to sit there and say, oh, you could have thrown that better. But it's way different when you've actually thrown a curling rock and tried to spin it and felt the pebbled rocks underneath your feet. Religion requires practice. You know, and when it comes down to things like Eucharistic adoration, when it comes down to things like going to confession, when it comes down to things like going into a soup kitchen and serving the poor and seeing the fact that there are people whom Jesus identifies himself with who need not just people who are nice to them, but people who, who sacrifice, who love them. We need to do these things. So yeah, number one, you need to pray. and You need to grow this deep, intimate, close relationship with Jesus. Number two, you need to do your hands. You need to go on conferences and retreats. You need to ask questions like Ryan was saying. And find out answers for yourself. You need to, you need to dive into this for yourself so that you know it for yourself. Um, I would like to guess that most of you have Bibles, right? Yeah. You need to do something with your Bible. Look very carefully because a lot of people forget to do this with their Bibles. You guys all watching? It's a very complicated process. I'll show you in case you missed it. I'll show you one more time, okay? You need to open it and you need to read it. Because here's what happens. Thank you for that polite and awkward applause. Okay. You need to open it and you need to read it because here's what happens. You see how God has spoken to other people in history. A lot of times we get kind of caught up in this God speaks in booming voices and burning bushes and things like that. And yeah, you know what he did? But for as many people as heard God in these extraordinary, you know, you know, earth-shattering ways, there's even more people to whom God spoke to in this gentle, still voice. I always think about Samuel's experience of hearing God's call for the first time. You don't know much about Samuel's story about hearing God call him for the first time? Yeah. Samuel is praying in the temple. He's apprenticed eh, to the prophet Eli, and he's, he's taking his turn praying in the temple. And all of a sudden, he hears somebody call his name. Now, you'd like to think that if you're praying and somebody calls your name, you're like, oh, yes, Lord. You know, but no, he jumps up, he runs out of the temple, he goes like, Samuel, you call, or Eli, you called me. What do you need? Go finish your prayers. Okay. Three times this happens until Eli realizes that the Lord is calling the boy. he goes and it begins the journeys of one of the most important prophets in the Old Testament but he mistook God's voice the first three times you read the Bible you realize what God's voice sounds like you read the Bible God speaks to you through these stories yourself you come to know them for yourself and when people challenge you on your faith and say well you're, you're a Catholic your religion believes blah 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 well you know the stories for yourself and you're like, no actually this is what it really says you can read it and know it for yourself all right First one was pray, second one was kind of this apprenticeship, this doing. The third one is, is something that, you know, we often will do once a month when we go to confession, but the church actually challenges us to do this every day. Um, any of you guys know what the Liturgy of the Hours is? Who's ever heard of that before? Okay. It's, it's a prayer that every priest, every deacon, every religious brother and sister, they, they promise to pray. It's part of their, their vows and their promises that, as they enter into their vocations. A lot of lay people do it as well, like people like us. But it, it, it's prayers that kind of sanctify the day. The last hour, the last sort of prayer of the day is something called night prayer. And night prayer always begins with an examination of conscience. A moment to stop and look back on your day. Now, we all do examinations of conscience when our parents make us go to confession, right? I have a friend whose parents actually write out his sins for him. Or did when he was little. He's, he's grown up now. They don't do it anymore. He's, you know, 38 and has four kids and stuff. But... Maybe they still write it out for him. I don't know. But we stop and examine our consciences at those moments. 
But the challenge, the invitation is to do this every day. So one of my spiritual heroes is a woman named Catherine Doherty. She founded Madonna House and a few other things. When she writes about examination of conscience, this is what she says. She says, to examine one's conscience means to recollect oneself, to collect all the fragments in total stillness, descend into your heart, and find what has to be thrown out. Now, those of you who wear glasses will understand a very particular pain and suffering. Dirty glasses. You know, glasses that get rained on. You know, the you know, sweat that sometimes, somehow, I don't even know how it gets onto my glasses, but, you know, it's like they get greasy. You know, you're cooking bacon. Your glasses get, like, grease, you know, bacon grease on them and stuff like that. What a glorious experience it is when you kind of clean them off as you go. And it's like, how on earth did they get that dirty? You know what I mean? Um, if you've ever been in a water fight, okay, those of you who don't have glasses, this one might, might work a little easier for you. Every water fight, I'm a youth minister, I run a lot of water fights, but every water fight I've ever, ever been in, there's always a group of people who are like, I'm not getting wet during this water fight. It's a water fight, you know what's going to happen, right? Yeah, I'm not going to get wet during this water fight. So what they end up doing is they'll be like, I'm going to run up, I'm going to throw water on you, I'm going to run away. And then at a certain point, they're like, you know what? Who cares? I'm getting soaked, but I'm taking 15 of you with me. You watch your parents when they wash their cars in the spring? You know, they'll, they'll, like, drive around puddles for those first few days, and at a certain point, it's like, what's the point? And they're, like, aiming for the puddles after a while. You know what I mean? Yeah. We're like this with sin. You can come out of confession and be resolved, I'm not going to sin anymore. But after a while, we tend to be a little bit more relaxed, whether it's lying, you know, whether it's the way we treat our parents, whether it's some of the stuff that we look at on the Internet, some of the stuff we know we shouldn't be looking at on the internet. We're more resolved about it at the beginning than we are at the end. And the beauty of examining your conscience is you take a step back and you look at the ways in which you are giving in to the temptations. The temptations to skew away from the truth. Because we all do. We all struggle with these things. I actually want to finish by doing a little kind of quick examination of conscience with you guys based on the writings of Catherine Doherty. Okay, it's four questions that she asks as an examination of conscience. And she says, the four questions, how much do I love? How do I portray Jesus? How far away from God am I? What place, to what places does my heart go? That's all I'm going to ask. I'll, I'll give a little bit of an explanation, and then we'll, we'll kind of finish with prayer. You guys good? Okay, so if you had on, please decapitate for a moment. Okay. That was a joke. You were supposed to laugh at it. I just never mind. <laughs> All right, never mind. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask you to help us to know our own hearts, to know the ways in which um, we, we've picked up these fragments of, of untruth, these fragments uh, of cheap imitations for the gospel that have drawn us away from you. And as we take a moment to reflect on, on these four particular areas, help us to recognize the things you want us to toss away so we might see you more clearly, might love you more deeply, and might follow you more closely. How much do I love? Most of the things that need to be thrown out here have to do with our own selfishness. How often does my, in my life does the pronoun I disappear, replaced by they, we, he or she? How do I betray Jesus? Now, automatically hearing that question, you're going to think of Judas. But remember something, Judas's betrayal was subtle. It was done with a gentle kiss. Which gentle but deadly sins do we kind of say, well, it's not that big a deal, it's fine. Things like pride and arrogance. Which things do we find excuses to avoid doing that we know we're supposed to do because it's not a big deal? How far away from God am I? If every decision is meant to lead us either towards heaven or away from him, what are the decisions we give into each day that lead us away from that, that end goal, that purpose of our lives? To what places does my heart go? In small ways and in big ways, you know, our, our hearts can get a little bit messy. Uh, but when we go to confession, we need to look for the things we've tucked away and set aside, kind of like the food that rots in the back of your fridge. You know, we kind of hide it away and forget about it. What are the things that we've done that in our hearts kind of tucked away? All right. 
and open your eyes again. Last word here, and then we'll finish with a Hail Mary. When you examine your conscience, it can be easy to sort of say, man, you see all the things that are wrong, all the bits that are wrong. Remember that when God looks at you, he doesn't just see those. He sees the whole of who you are, the beauty and the goodness of who you are as his son or daughter. And he loves all of who you are, and he wants to help you get to that goal of tossing away the fragments and becoming the saint he created you to be. Recognizing that you have sin should not be where you stop. What's most important is what you do next. If you got stuff you got to take to confession, run, don't walk there. Leave the sin behind and start over again. God loves you more than you know. Let's finish with a Hail Mary. Hail Mary.